for all the um, for all the talented authors that uh, that we get to host, it's still rather rare to be introducing one as accomplished in the business world as Peter Thiel. Uh, he has one of the most successful track records of any tech investor entrepreneur over the past decade and a half, starting with PayPal, which began in 1998, and then Palantir Technologies, the data analytics company uh, he set up in 2004. That same year, he made the first outside investment in Facebook. If any of you saw the movie Social Network, uh, Peter was the guy who offered Mark Zuckerberg a startup investment of $500,000. And Peter continues to serve on Facebook's board of directors. He's also provided startup funding for such other well-known ventures as LinkedIn, Yelp, and SpaceX, the private space technology company started by his fellow PayPal founder, Elon Musk. And through his venture capital firm, Founders Fund, Peter continues searching for game-changing companies to help build. But along with uh, his business prowess, Peter has proved himself a philosophical force as well, unafraid to go against conventional thinking. In fact, his views on investing contain a strong contrarian element. He advocates identifying opportunity in places where people are not looking. He contends competition can be bad for business and monopolies drive progress. And he's argued that much of the technological innovation of recent decades has fallen short. Uh, just go to the website of his Founders Fund and you'll see the slogan, quote, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. Profiles of Peter often cite his support of some uh, rather utopian projects, such as reversing human aging and experimental floating cities in the ocean beyond the reach of governments. One of his most controversial positions has been to challenge a college education which he's faulted for stifling entrepreneurship. Several years ago, he started awarding fellowships to people under 20 to skip college and start companies. But despite his critical view of higher education, Peter has remained involved with his own alma mater, Stanford University. It was a computer science course he taught there in 2012 that became the genesis of his new book, Zero to One, Notes on Startups, or How to Build a Future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Peter Thiel. Thank you, thank you very much, Bradley. Uh, uh, there's so many different uh, things I'd like to cover tonight, but one, you know, one of the challenges in teaching about entrepreneurship, um, either at a class or trying to do it in a book, is that uh, I, I think it's one of these things that's extremely poorly taught. That, and I think there's sort of two typical ways people go about it. Uh, one mod modality is that you tell um, anecdotal stories from your own past. So I would, I would, I'd give a speech here tonight and I'd tell you about how I started PayPal in 98, 99, how we linked money and email. And they'd be sort of these fun war stories, but there's really not that much I think that people can learn from that. And then I think the other, the other sort of approach people take in writing business books and books about entrepreneurship is to offer these pseudo-scientific formulas where it's, okay, you follow these five steps and then you'll build a successful company. And I think that's also, uh, that also doesn't quite work. And I think both of these um, uh, sort of standard business book genres, in my mind, are somewhat off because um, there's a sense in which Every moment in business happens only once. Every moment in the history of technology happens only once. The next Bill Gates will not be building an operating system. The next Larry Page won't build a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg won't be building a social network. And so if you're copying these guys, in some sense, you're not learning from them. Um, and, uh, and, and, this is, um, and, and this is sort of the point of departure of, of the book Zero to One. It's, it's uh, Zero to One are doing things that have not been done before, the breakthrough technologies, uh, breakthrough companies of, of one sort or another where there's no precise pattern that's existed in the past. And, um, and, uh, and so the question is, what can one actually systematically say about these sorts of businesses? <clears throat> um, you can't, um, 
And, and I try to get at them through all these indirect contrarian questions. The, the indirect business question is, what great business is nobody building? And then the, uh, the indirect, more intellectual version of this is, tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on. And this is always, I think, a fantastic interview question. It's, uh, it's quite a hard one for people to answer for two somewhat different reasons. First, uh, you always, um, you always, we've all been taught that truth is conventional. It's, it's based on what everybody else already widely agrees to be true. And so it seems always really hard to come up with new truths that people have not yet figured out. But I think um, there's an even sort of more fundamental reason, which is that when you're in, in the context of a, an interview, someone's asking you that question. To answer it, you'd have to tell the person something they wouldn't agree with. If, if, if they said, oh, I thought of that already, that's, I totally agree with that, that's a bad answer. And, um, and so good answers require you to be somewhat courageous, to say things people might not want to hear. And we, we live in a world, I think, in which uh, courage is in far shorter supply than, than genius. Um, and uh, somehow, both of these things need to be uh, combined to come up with, uh, with, the, with these uh, new ideas and with these, with these new sorts of businesses. So I want to give, um, give three or four answers that I've, I offer in this book. In some ways, zero to one is just a whole series of answers to this question, things that most people believe to be true that I think are not true. And, um, and we sort of go through them as, as a way to sort of get people to think about business in some new ways. And I, I want to give you three or four answers to, to this question today. Uh, one, of the, one of the answers was already alluded to in the introduction, I, um, and this is sort of the starting point, that you know, if, you have a, if you have sort of a unique company, um, one of the virtues of building a company of which there are no others in the world is that you don't have to compete. And, uh, and if you don't compete, you get this monopoly, and then you, you end up with a very profitable sort of a business. Uh, um, the, the, uh, you know, there's, there's the opening sentence from Anna Karenina says that uh, all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. Um, and I think the opposite is true of business. All happy companies are, um, are different because they found something unique that they could do. All unhappy companies are alike because they fail to escape the essential sameness that is competition. And, um, and the, uh, the, the chapter title, All Happy Companies Are Different, uh, when, I, when I got this uh, published as an excerpt in the Wall Street Journal, they re-entitled it from All Happy Companies Are, uh, are Different to uh, Competition is for Losers, which uh, got a lot of page hits. Um, and is of course, and of course, um, is sort of, it's a little bit punchier than I would have gone with initially, but it, it, it is, it really goes to the core of, uh, of this thesis because we're always taught that competition is for winners that winners are people who compete harder and more than other people. And that's why it's such a shocking idea that, that, um, that if you're obsessed with competition, you're somehow already playing a losing game. If you decided that what you're gonna do with your life is compete ferociously, somehow maybe you're already trapped in something that too many people are doing that's, that's, uh, that's ill-advised in, in one, way, one way or another. Um, and so, so the, the contrarian idea is in some sense that, you know, capitalism and competition, people think are antonyms, people think they're synonyms, I think they're antonyms. Capitalist is someone who accumulates capital. A world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits get competed away. Um, and so, you know, if, if, you, if you think about like the, um, a restaurant business is a business that is incredibly competitive and not very profitable. Nobody ever makes money opening a restaurant. If, um, and, and sort of at the other end, you have these sort of companies like Google, which are um, very capitalistic. They've had enormous profit streams for 12 years now, and somehow they've had no real competition in search uh, since 2002 in the case of Google, when they definitively distanced themselves from uh, Yahoo and Microsoft. Um, now, I, th I think this question of, uh, of competition is, it's not just sort of an, it's an intellectual mistake of sorts, and one of the reasons it's so confusing in business is that the people who have uh, the people who have monopolies pretend not to have them. The people who don't have monopolies pretend to have them. And so the apparent difference is much smaller than the real difference. And I, I think in business you can almost say that there's, to, to first approximation, there only are two kinds of companies in this world. There are companies that are in ferocious competition and no one makes any money, and there are companies that are monopolies that do, do very well. And the, the distortion that's involved is that if you have a monopoly, you will always talk about being in an incredibly much, much bigger market than you're really in. So if you're a company like Google, you will say that you're in the technology industry and you're competing with Android on cell phones and you're competing with uh, 
Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft, and it's just incredible. You're in this technology space and you're competing with car companies, and it's incredibly competitive everywhere. And on the other hand, if you were to open a restaurant here in Washington, D.C., and you're trying to get money from investors, and they, they say, well, I don't want to invest in restaurants because they all closed, you'd say things like, well, this is going to be the only British Nepalese fusion cuisine in, um, in, this, in, this, uh, in, in southeast D.C., wherever you, know, wherever you choose to locate it. And, um, and you sort of artificially narrow it in, in this, again, somewhat fictitious way. And so I think, I think this question is, is very obscured, and it's, it's one people um, underestimate tremendously. But I think there's also, it's not just sort of this intellectual failure that we don't understand, but it's also this psychological or ideological system where we're, we're sort of trained to compete. This is what we're trained to do from K through 16. Um, we're, we're tracked in all these different ways. And, um, and you know, what competition does is it does make you better at whatever it is you're competing on. So if you're like on a high school athletic team, you're competing, you're becoming a better swimmer, you're competing against the other people on the team, you're looking at the people around you, you're comparing yourself to them, and you're getting better than they are. But you often lose sight of things that are more important or more valuable. And I think that's always this, uh, this very, uh, very subtle trade-off that happens in these, uh, in these competitive dynamics. There was, there was this uh, classic line uh, Henry Kissinger had at uh, Harvard where you know, the, um, the battles in academia are so ferocious because the stakes are so small. And this always sounds, this sounds like a formula for insane, sort of describing all his fellow professors at Harvard, and they're, also, they're sort of collectively insane. Why, why are they fighting so intensely if the stakes are so small? Um, and on one level, it's a description of insanity. On another level, though, it, is, it, it just comes from the logic of the situation. If the stakes are small because people can't differentiate themselves, then you have to fight even harder, and, uh, and you sort of get into this, that, sort of a, that sort of an equilibrium. And, um, and so I think it's always worth thinking really hard about how to, how to break uh, free from, from this sort of competition. Um, a, second, a second somewhat related idea to this, uh, this idea that, uh, that we should try to find ways to escape from competition uh, is, that, um, is that there actually are many things that can be done. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the, you know, I think one of the sort of common sense intuitions people have about my question, tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on, is that, well, there are no real answers to that. It's, it's all the answers have already been found. Uh, we, we know everything, and anything we don't know is, is way too hard to figure out. And I, I sort of offer this, suggest there's this trichotomy of conventions, things everybody already knows to be true, mysteries, things that are impossible for anybody to figure out, and then there are these intermediate things, which I call secrets, which you could figure out if you work really hard to figure them out. And I think we're in a, we're in a world in which most people don't really believe that there are any secrets left. They don't believe that there are any interesting questions or inter interesting answers to my question they, they can get to. Um, and there certainly are certain um, areas in which there used to be secrets and there are none left. So if you were growing up in the 17th or 18th century and you looked at a map and there were some empty spaces on the map, you know, there was a way to find out. It was hard. You'd have to go there and being explorer was kind of a dangerous, dangerous business, but you could go there and you could find out what existed. Um, and, uh, you know, today if you were, if you're growing up and you had your, you, 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 there probably is not that much left on the map of the world to discover that hasn't been discovered. Or if you were in the 19th century, um, you could try to be filling out the uh, periodic table of elements. Uh, whereas, again, if you were growing up in the 21st century, we probably would be discouraging you from going into a career in geography or, or basic chemistry because all these things have been discovered. But when I, what I want to suggest to you is that most things are not like geography or chemistry. Um, most fields still have uh, a certain openness. I think there's, there's a tremendous amount, certainly, in the, in the computer field where uh, we are, where we've seen uh, enormous progress in the last 40 years. And I actually, um, and even though I think there's been less innovation in, in many other areas, I, I don't think that it's because we've run out of ideas or it's not possible to find things. I think it's in some ways that we haven't been trying as hard. We've been telling ourselves it's too hard to do things. And so um, we've had this dual-tracked world where there's been a lot of innovation in bits, 
less innovation in atoms and things involving, say, energy or um, transportation or space travel or flying cars or all the things people were talking about in the 50s and 60s. But I, I think even in a lot of those areas, when, when I spend time talking to scientists or people working on them, I get the sense that there's a lot more that we could be doing. And I, I think it's sort of this cultural um, decision that we've, we've given up on, on trying for a lot of these things. Um, one, one of the, you know, it's, it's always hard to speculate on all the different reasons why we've stopped uh, trying to, to find these secrets, but I think, I think one of them has to do with the, the sort of flatness that uh, we feel as part of the global, globalizing world. If you're in a world of seven billion people, you sort of think, well, someone else has already figured this out, or it's unbelievably hard to figure out and there's no point in trying. And when, when everybody thinks that about every problem you're working on, then people stop trying and you stop figuring things out. And I think that's, that's one cut on, on what, what has happened in our, um, in our society in, in many places in, in recent decades. I think, that, um, I think that a belief in secrets is an effective truth. If you think that you can find things, it's hard to do them, but you can, you can, you can do it, you'll be a person who will try, and then that's sort of one of the ways you get, you get started on this sort of a process. So, so I think that there are many answers to these, um, these contrarian questions. I think that these are the core of what makes for great businesses, great ventures. It's the core of, of a way to escape from uh, the competition that surrounds us in so many contexts. Let me end with um, one, um, a third uh, uh, sort of uh, um, non-conventional thought, um, a little bit on, on, a, on a slightly bigger scale. I think that in the 21st century, if we're gonna have a successful 21st century, I think it will involve two different modes of progress. One will be um, copying things that work, globalization, going from one to N, horizontal growth. And the other one will be um, technological progress, going from zero to one, vertical intensive innovation. I always draw these globalization on the X axis and technology on the Y axis to underscore how I think these two concepts are very different. We, al we always tend to use them too synonymously, and I think, I think it's, it's good to, to really differentiate these two ideas as, as very different sorts of concepts. Um, and I, th I think the, uh, the thing that's worth thinking about in terms of the history of the last few centuries is that there have been periods of globalization and there have been periods of technology, and they have been actually quite disconnected. So the 19th century was a period when you had both globalization and technology. You had a lot happening on both. 1914, World War I starts. Uh, globalization goes massively in reverse. Trade goes down. There's, you know, um, the whole world sort of gets more fragmented. Um, and, um, and it probably goes in reverse, I would argue, all the way till 1971, um, when uh, Kissinger goes to China and globalization restarts. And we think of the last four plus decades as the period when China has been sort of the, the core of this globalizing world once again. But at the same time, there's enormous technological progress. So 1914 to 71 is a period of massive technological innovation, uh, whereas there was not that much globalization. And then since 1971, we've had enormous amounts of globalization and uh, sort of a somewhat more limited technological progress, more focused on computers. And I think this, um, this um, this is sort of reflected in the way that we talk about the world. In the 1950s or 1960s, people would have talked about a first world and a third world. The first world was that part of the world that was accelerating technologically. The third world was that part of the world where um, everything was sort of just permanently messed up and broken. Um, and today we would talk about a developing and developed world. The developing part of the world is that part that's copying the developed world. It's um, hopefully, it may skip a few steps. Uh, um, but it basically is this pro-globalization dichotomy. It's this convergence theory of history where the develop, uh, developing world will become like the developed world. But, um, but while this is a pro-globalization dichotomy, it's also an anti-technology one. Because when we say that we are living in the developed world, we are implicitly saying that we're living in the part of the world where nothing new is going to happen, where it's done, it's finished, it's static, it's going to be stagnant. Uh, the younger generation should expect less than the uh, generation that came before. And I think that's, that's an intuition that we should resist extremely strenuously. I think that um, for, uh, for people in the United States, for people in Western Europe, Japan, 
uh, throughout the developed world. I think the question of technology is far more important than the question of globalization. And I, um, and I think we should not uh, so readily accept this, this label that we're living in the developed world. And so I think the, the sort of contrarian counter question that I think we should always come back to is how can we go about developing the developed world? Thank you very much. Yeah, they're on, right? Okay. Um, so we're going to take questions now, and there's a, a microphone there and a microphone there, and um, if you'll just make your way to one or the other, um, that'll be great. But while we're waiting for that, let me just ask the first question, Peter. I mean, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to pick up your book and read it and, and, and get very excited and want to go out and become entrepreneurs. Um, does the world need a lot more entrepreneurs? I, th I think um, I think the world needs uh, more entrepreneurs that are um, that are doing um, building great companies. So I, th I think that uh, you know we don't necessarily need a fourth online pet food company or a tenth thin film solar panel company, but uh, but certainly there's always room for for more uh, more innovation. I'm I, I'm always a little bit um, hesitant about the word entrepreneur. You know, I was talking to one of my friends um, a few years ago, asking him, you know, what do you want to be doing in five, ten years' time? Oh, it's really clear. I want to be an entrepreneur, and that's. I think that's often sort of like saying I want to be rich or I want to be famous. Um, and you should never think of being an entrepreneur as a line item on your resume. You should always think of it as something you do. You start a company as a way to solve an important problem. It's sort of a crazy thing to start a company, but sometimes the best way to solve problems is to start small new businesses, small new ventures of one sort or another. And so um, that's, that's why you become an entrepreneur, in order to solve an important problem, not to have a line item on your resume. You think entrepreneurs are, are made or born? It's probably, there, there probably are, there are there, I, sus, I have a whole chapter where I go through this, but I, I think there's probably some combination of nature, nurture, some part of it's mythological, so it's always so hard to know what actually happened. So much of this gets uh, fictionalized in, in strange ways. I, I think you often have these fairly extreme, somewhat charismatic people who, who help uh, start these businesses. There's, there's some exaggeration, and, uh, and then I think it's some combination of some extreme traits that they also end up cultivating over time. Okay, well, it looks like we have quite a few questions. Uh, which side do you want to start with? Sure, let's go ahead and let's just, yeah. Sure thing. Uh, Peter, love the book. Uh, thanks for writing it. Um, Thank you for putting the uh, Unabomber and Hipster side by side. I think that was the first time that that's uh, ever been done. Um, my question is, I recently left the military. Uh, so many military members who have recently left cite either iatrogenics or uh, the unintended consequences of combating terrorism conventionally with uh, Palantir and initiatives like that uh, that fight terrorism through data and preempt uh, strikes before they happen. Um, what would you say to military members who maybe want to join Palantir or a company like that, rather than traditional college degrees, what type of credential would you advocate for them? A body of work? Um, um, I'm, always, I'm always hard to uh, press to give very precise answers on this, but I think, I think on, the, on, the, on the case of Palantir, it would be, uh, you, know, you should talk to me after, after the event. So sure. talk to me after the event as far as Palantir goes. Um, in, ge in general, I think there, the, one, one of the skill sets that is, is very much, uh, where there is still an enormous shortage in our society, are all sorts, of, all forms of computer programming in, in, in all these different ways. And uh, it is something people can learn fairly quickly. I think you can get to a level where you can get a reasonably well-paying job in, in three or four months. Sure. And so I think this is sort of a, a very general thing that people, people can be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Peter. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is David Berger. I'm the founder of the Digital Currency Council, which is training lawyers, accountants, and financial advisors on Bitcoin and other digital currencies. Um, I read today the news of PayPal's um, new partnership with some of the payment platforms, Coinbase and BitPay. And um, I guess I wanted to flip your interview question on its head and ask, what's one thing, what's a truth about Bitcoin that you think um, 
that others haven't realized yet? Um, well, let's see. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how widely realized this is or not, but I, 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 I sort of think of Bitcoin as the mirror image of what we try to do at PayPal. So PayPal, um, we actually had this uh, slogan, we're going to create the new world currency. We were very interested in all these cryptocurrency systems. We never really quite succeeded in building it, but we built a great uh, payment system. And I think Bitcoin has succeeded in building a new currency, at least on the level of speculation. Um, but there isn't that much you can do with it in terms of making actual payments. And, uh, and so I think that, uh, I think people have to figure out how to get the payment part to, uh, to really work, and not just for super sketchy illegal transactions, also for, you know, things where uh, people uh, don't want to put up with enormous hassle to, to enable a transaction to go through. And so I think that's, uh, that's a critical thing that, uh, that has to happen uh, in, in the Bitcoin space. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the analogy on chemistry and geography. I understand the analogy, but I please choose another discipline besides chemistry. As a chemist, I need to tell you that there's a lot of amazing things that have been happening and will be happening. <laughs> and, and frankly, it, it, it's a little bit like at the end of the 1800s, the early 1900s, they said, well, everything that can be discovered in physics has been discovered. Yeah, I, I meant to, I meant to, I, I think I said basic chemistry. I wanted to you sort of... You did say basic chemistry. So I wanted to, uh, I, I, was, I intentionally put that uh, adjective no. in there. I understand, but it is exactly that hopeful attitude that you expressed about how you can do great things that still brings people to great discoveries in chemistry and brings them Nobel Prizes, so thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Thiel. My name is Jess. I'm a former U.S. government intelligence analyst who left government and went to business school and got his MBA, and I've since launched two uh, social networks. I know you're feeling about social network ventures. Um, from a recent um, Fortune article. Anyway, one of the, uh, one of the ventures connects pr uh, professionals for, for um, networking during workday breaks, and the other one helps professionals learn how to qu acquire federal clearances based on shared learnings. My question for you is, um, before you were, you were wealthy, what strategies did you use to get people to help you when it wasn't immediately clear to them that it was in their self-interest? Um, you know, it's, I, I don't know if I had a great, great answer to that. I mean, I, th I think that the, the, uh, the thing that, uh, I, I think it's always a mistake to think of these things as too tactical, where everything is just transactional and it's a question of how do you, um, what buttons do you push to get someone to help you? What buttons do you need to push to get someone to write a check or to, um, to, to do whatever you're trying to get people to do. I think the, uh, I think the, um, the, the, the part that I think is always very underrated in our society is uh, building long-term relationships. Uh, and one of the things that worked out at PayPal was that we built all these great friendships. And one, one of the ideas we had when we started PayPal, when none of us were, were wealthy, was that we wanted to build fantastic friendships among the people inside the company so that even if um, it didn't work, the friendships would persist and we'd work together on on other things in the future, and I, I think that uh, I think that sort of a that sort of a perspective um, is is important. So it's, I think it's always um, important to somehow find ways to to work with people that make sense. It's important to have real relationships. I I prefer friendships over networking. I always think networking is sort of a is is kind of a uh, bad business idea. You know, if you one of the one of the prehistory questions I always like to ask. Uh, companies when they're they're pitching me is what was the prehistory of the people involved um, and you know where did you meet and if it was like well we just met at a networking event where we both wanted to be entrepreneurs um, a week ago and we decided to start a company that's that's normally uh, a bad sign it's like it's like we met at the slot machines in Las Vegas and we decided to get married and you might hit the jackpot but it's generally a bad idea and I think um, I think the the better prehistory is one where there are um, You've been, you've been friends, you've been working together for a long time, and then you, you build up from there. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for coming. Uh, so, investor Howard Marks talks about contrarianism in terms of thinking differently uh, and better. So how would you advise us to think better as well as differently? Well, it's, it's, it's cer certainly, um, the, the but I want to really underscore, the emphasis here is not on 
being contrarian for its own sake or just being disagreeable or, or difficult. So it's always what is true that nobody agrees with you on or what, what great business is nobody else building. So, so these are, um, these are very, uh, very important, uh, important um, qualifiers to it. It's, um, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it, it is one of these things that's very oddly much easier said than done. You know, it's uh, already in the time of Shakespeare, the word ape meant both primate and to imitate. So there is something about, about us where we are, um, are always incredibly influenced by the people around us and easily uh, co-opted. There's this very strange phenomenon in Silicon Valley where so many of the um, successful founders seem to be suffering from a mild form of Asperger's or something like that. And, and, um, and I've often thought that um, this really uh, should be turned around as a critique of our society. What sort of a society is it where all of the people who are socially well adapted are sort of discouraged from any heterodox great ideas they have through all the subtle social cues they pick up? Oh, that's too weird. That's kind of strange. No, you probably shouldn't do that. And they're sort of discouraged before their ideas are even uh, fully formed. Um, and, and so I think that this is, that's sort of a we have to sort of be aware that that's the, the challenge that we, we, we're, constantly, um, we're constantly up against. Um, I think, I think one, one good way to get at, uh, at uh, sort of um, unconventional truths is to just be very passionate about some substantive area. You know, so at, at PayPal, I was very interested in the, the cryptocurrency piece. We didn't, we didn't succeed in building a, a new currency, but it was a way to sort of really push our thinking and it, it helped it helped inform us in ways that we were then able to actually build a much better payment system. And so I think um, you always want to have something where you're focused on something that's different from just comparing yourself to the people around you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Klopp. I'm director of business development for StarCore Nuclear. We're um, developing a small modular reactor, um, inherently safe according to the IAEA and it's for distribution around the world, not for on-grid markets. So my question is a simple one. Would you be interested in discussing financing something like this? And how can I get this in front of you? Instead? You know, this has just turned into an episode of Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> how much would it take? <laughs> so uh, let's see. So we, we have actually invested in a few different nuclear companies. So we I are, know Leslie. We are, uh, we are very, um, it's, uh, we're very nervous about all the regulatory hurdles that exist, but I actually do think there's some interesting things that can be done from a um, technology perspective, and it's an area that's, that's very underexplored. So my, uh, my generic answer, and this is both partially an evasion, an attempt to avoid getting mobbed in a sort of an insane way here, but uh, my, my generic answer is find somebody that I trust, have them get, give a recommendation, and, uh, and then we'll follow up. Could you give us a list of people that we could, uh, uh, that we could, <laughs> no, that's, neighbors, that's, friends, colleagues, uh, Leslie? So, so, uh, someone, 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 um, someone I trust enough that uh, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. I, I don't want to give a list out, but All yeah. right. Okay. It's worth a shot, right? No. It never hurts to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Rockwood, documentary filmmaker. I'm making a film called Money Talks about money and politics. I was filming your friend, uh, Harvard professor Larry Lessig over the last weekend. I salute you for contributing to his May Day Super PAC about disrupting the way campaigns are financed. Simple question, why did you step up and bless you for doing so, for making that contribution to the May Day Super PAC? Well, I, um, you know, I, I always have this somewhat schizophrenic view on what to do about politics. I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important, um, and then I think it's also very broken. So this is actually, this is probably something I believe that's conventional and true and probably actually important that a lot of people would agree with that our political system is, is quite broken. And so I always go back and forth on, are, is it worth trying to fix things? Should you just uh, ignore it and, uh, and, and uh, go ahead? And, um, and I've, I've known Professor Lessig for a long time. Um, I think it's somewhat of a long shot, but I think, um, I think it's, it's worth trying to come up with some new creative ways to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to reduce the, the influence of special uh, interests in our, in our political system. I end up spending most of my time focused on, on technology in Silicon Valley because that's where I feel I have the ability to do things. But I, I do think the, it's, and I, so I always have this odd sense about DC that somehow it's very important what's going on here and it's um, endlessly frustrating. Thank you. Agreed. 
Good evening, Peter. My name is Dustin Cantor, and my question is around dreaming versus doing. Uh, and it's pulled from Hartley PV. He's been running his business for 50 years, wanted to be a rock star, realized he couldn't do it. So he started making speakers so he could stay around the rock star community, one of the most successful music electronics business in the world. I couldn't be a professional athlete, so I said, let's support health and fitness professionals because a lot of people need to lose weight. I'll make my right way around the healthiest people. What do you say to entrepreneurs who are looking through their different choices as far as what business they'll pursue and how to attract the right types of mentors and investors as for someone for myself who needs doctors in our first round of funding and so forth. So I wonder how do we stop dreaming and start doing? Um, yeah, it's, I, again, I'm, um, I, th I generally think we should do more and, you know, I, I, dream, dreaming is ambiguous. I think there's some times where it's actually really cool to have dreams that are, um, that are incredible. It's, it's what's, the, the new, the, the place where I agree with you that uh, dreaming is overdone, dreaming is bad, I think, when you dream of doing things that lots of other people are doing. So I'll again go back to my competition thing. It's, it's actually, I think it's really cool to have, um, a dream of a very different, better world that no one has thought of before. Uh, and maybe you have to first dream of that before you do it. Um, but I think it's, um, but I think what's happened so often is that people have these dreams that are just uh, super conventional. So it's, you know, there are 20,000 people a year who move to Los Angeles to become movie stars. Maybe 20 of them make it. Uh, and so I think there is something, there's something dynamic about it, but there's something also a little bit crazy about that. And so, so I, that's, that's, that's the nuance I, I would have. But, uh, Definitely agree with it. All right, thanks. I'll... Thank you. Um, so my name is Mark Lutter. I'm a PhD student in economics. Um, and my, you donate to the Seasteading Institute. And uh, also, there's a project going on in Honduras, the Z Zona de Empleo y Desarrollo Económico, formerly known as uh, Charter Cities. And I was wondering how social technology fits in your framework of sort of technology versus zero to one versus competition. Social technology as in seasteading innovative different, innovating different forms of governance. Um, so uh, let's see, a lot of different things in that, in that question. Um, I, you know, the seasteading project was a very small uh, side project I got involved with. It, it, it got tremendous attention, tremendous interest because there's always this sense that our, um, our frontier is so um, is so closed, and that there's no new place for people to go. And, and the U.S. Uh, used to be defined as a country where there was always a frontier where you could move to. Um, and uh, and so, and so if you say, well, maybe the frontier is to be found in the ocean, that that actually engages people in the conversation because there are all these questions: Would you organize society differently if you could start with new governments, new communities? How would you how would you redo that? Uh, and so I. Um, I do, th I do think that um, we should be trying many different kinds of things. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, I generally think that, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think if you want to have a fantastic business, you want to be doing something one of a kind. So if you could start a new country, um, probably the right business model would be to start one that's somehow very differentiated from other countries. And that's how you'd, that's how you'd um, have a super successful country. Whereas if you did one that was very undifferentiated, that might be, um, that, that might be less successful. And so it's always a good question. You know, what, what is, you know, what is the, you know, I think the business model of the United States today as a country, for example, is that we're the country where people do new things. And that's our advantage. That's our comparative advantage. We have to think really hard about how to maintain that. If we ever lose that, then we're just in this, you know, even more um, crazed global competition with everybody else. Thank you. Uh, Peter, thank you for writing the book. Uh, if I was the Wizard of Oz and I could grant you one wish to solve a social problem that's important to you, what would it be and why? I'm never sure whether I should believe the <laughs> implicit hypotheticals in these questions, you know? I mean, I might ask for three wishes, I don't know, but no, ser no seriously. Well, um, here, here, here's your moment to dream. <laughs> yes. I think um, this, is, this is not a precisely defined, I'll, I'll give a vague answer and then I'll give a more specific answer. So I think the, the vague general answer is that uh, we, we um, I'd like us, 
as a society to believe more in the future. I think we live in a, we live in a um, capitalist and financial age. We do not live in a scientific or technological age. And, uh, and I, I actually think that most of our culture is, um, is actually quite hostile to science and technology. We don't want technology to happen. And uh, the easy way to illustrate how hostile our, our society is, is to just look at all the science fiction movies. They all show technology that doesn't work, that kills people, that's destructive. And the future looks like maybe it's Terminator, maybe it's Avatar, maybe it's Elysium, maybe it's The Matrix. I saw the Gravity movie recently. You know, you're really happy to be back on a muddy island somewhere. And, um, and, so, um, and so we have, uh, we've, we've come to believe that the future is something to be feared. Um, and so you end up with a very conservative bias in the sense of not wanting anything to change. People would rather live in a Victorian house than, than in a, a Jetsons type, type place. Um, and so I think if there would be some way you could do this and, and get us um, to shift our thinking back to the future, that would be, um, that would be a tremendous uh, cultural change. And I think there are all these very specific things I could, specific problems I could mention. You know, it's one out of three people at age 85 has dementia. We should have a war on Alzheimer's and we should cure that. And you know, m maybe it's not curable. I, I, th I, I suspect, I, I think it is curable. I think it's reversible or, or preventable. But, um, but we should at least try really hard. You know, f uh, we should at least figure out why it's impossible to cure. Um, and uh, and th there is some sort of a decline. You know, we had a war on cancer in 1970. It turned out to be harder than people thought. But, uh, but we, we shouldn't give up on, on trying to do things like that. Um, Amy Wilkinson, I'm with Harvard and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, you're a contrarian that's known to be right most of the time. I'm curious if you can give an example of being a contrarian when you were wrong, or more generally the guardrails that you put around that kind of thinking so that you pursue ideas that matter. You spend your time around things that are not just unique and fresh and different, but actually will make the world more interesting and better. Well, I think I think there are, I think there are many instances where where I've been you know where I've been uh, wrong in, in in all sorts of uh, all sorts of different ways. Um, I think that uh, I think that it's it's always a bit it's always a bit hard to know, um, you know, it's always a bit hard to know exactly how to calibrate. Uh, um, you know, what point do you know? At what point do you, should you give up on trying something, something really different? At what point do you get feedback that it's not working, or are you just on the cusp of it getting to work? So this is like a very important problem. And I think the, I know the, the sort of the math analogy I give is like the uh, airport luggage problem, where the probability that the luggage shows up goes up and up and up every second, and then all of a sudden it drops off, and you know it's not coming at all. And um, <laughs> and so there's similarly there there are things where we should work on them. And uh, and and we sh and we should think the success is getting closer and closer. But at some point, when it hasn't worked, there's sort of an indication that maybe uh, maybe we're um, maybe we're all altogether off. The um, I, I would say I would say one um, one perspective I have though is that uh, that I think um, that that even if you're in the consensus and right all the time, that doesn't get you very far, you know. It's, if, if you're if you're good at if you get an A on every test, um, it's you know this is sort of you're still just tracking with where you know where so many other other people are, and I think the real value comes from um, from uh, being right and being you know outside the consensus, and that's that's what one should explore. And so I, th I think it's often um, so of often the, the things I have the biggest regrets about are are times when um, when I was when I sort of got caught up in the consensus, even though I should have known better. And that's, those are probably the places where I, I think I made, you know, I made the most mistakes. Can I, can I just follow up uh, on that and ask you a little bit about dealing with setbacks or failures? I mean, you've been so successful that your, your, your setbacks and failures, such as they've been, tend to be glossed over. You talk about one in your book, the, the disappointment that you felt in not getting a Supreme Court Supreme Court clerkship and how in retrospect that ended up being probably one of the greatest things to, to happen to you uh, But how, how have you dealt with some of your other setbacks? Well, I've, you know, I've had I've had my share of setbacks. You know, I, I was uh, uh, Ran a global macro fund. We uh, 
we uh, lost uh, um, money in 09, 010, and a lot of investors pulled out. I mean, it had a good, it had a very good run, but, uh, but that was definitely a, a setback of sorts. Uh, the Supreme Court, not getting the Supreme Court clerkship at age 25 was the end of the world. I mean, I, I, I you know, it was like unbelievably traumatic. It was like, because I, I, and I, th I think that when you're in these very talented, hyper-competitive tracks, um, uh, so much of your identity gets wrapped up in just getting that one next prize, that one next thing. And so, you know, when you get it, it's never enough. But when you don't get it, it's, it's always, uh, always uh, really devastating. My... My own, you know, my, my own sense is there, you know, there, I, I think you should always try to learn from these things, you try to put them in perspective, but um, in general, I'm actually somewhat skeptical of this idea that there's a lot to be learned from failure, um, or that there's something terribly good about failure. I think, I think, you know, I think every time a company goes out of business, it's not a, you know, this is not like some beautiful aesthetic working of the market, or it's, a, it's not some great learning experience. I think it's every death is a tragedy. And the death of every business is a tragedy, and we should we should try to try to prevent these things. Um, and I, I think I think I, I'm not sure people actually learn that much from failure in general, because um, because I think in many cases failure is very overdetermined. You failed for a whole series of different reasons, and and you won't actually. And so you do it the next time around. You you failed for five separate reasons. You understand you failed for num reason number one, you worked with the wrong people, you work with some different people, but then you have, you know, the wrong business strategy or, or something. So, um, so I, d I think people don't learn that much from failure. And it's, it's one of these, that's one of, the, one of the conventional wisdom things I always push back on a lot. Hi, Mr. Teal. Uh, my name is Rahul Desai, and I'm a 19-year-old Georgetown sophomore. I run a company called Trendify, which actually uses data to predict all those things you mentioned that kill businesses. Um, on Will Legate's recommendation, I'm actually applying to the Teal Fellowship this year. So I wanted to know, who was your best mentor and how did they shape your thinking? Also, would you tell Chama Paliheptia at Social Capital I say hi? Um, I'm not sure I will do all those things, but um, <laughs> um, I'm, always, I'm always bad at answering the mentor question uh, because I think that, uh, I, th I think that you know, the, probably my parents influenced me the most. Uh, there were definitely, I learned a lot from, um, from various friends I, I worked with at PayPal. There's something about that that was very formative. Uh, but I, I, think, I think people in Silicon Valley are generally quite bad at answering the mentor question because uh, everything has this sort of um, new, wasn't done before aspect, uh, aspect to it. Um, and so the question of role models is always uh, a very tricky one. Dick Frankel, uh, another chemist, but not at all a chemical question, uh, an ethical question. Um, I don't know how involved you remain in PayPal, quite possibly not at all, but... Uh, not at all. I think that's... I want to... But go ahead. Uh, the thing is, uh, PayPal asserts that does not deal with racist or other such, a, such, a, such nasty organizations, and yet when we pointed out to them a site that they were serving, which was as nasty as you could think of, they evaded the question, avoided it, and did not do anything about it. <laughs> well, I, I, can't, I can't speak to the details of what was involved. I've not been involved with PayPal for, for 12 years. Uh, you know, so I think, I think there's always, there, in, in, inside these companies, there's always some balancing of is there freedom of speech, is there freedom of commerce, or are what people, is, do, are, is what people are doing really bad, and it's, it's somewhat of a somewhat of a case by case uh, determination. But I'm, I, I can't really speak to that since I haven't been involved for 12 years. Hi, Peter. Good evening. Thanks for coming out. I'm Eric Bremen. Uh, I wanted to ask you, especially given your comments about failures being uh, tragedies, if you could comment, if you have two choices between pursuing something truly great, although you know there's a high chance of failure and perhaps failing pursuing something that it's still above average, perhaps exceptional in some way, but uh, lower risk with a higher chance of succeeding. Now, could you comment on, you know, those two options, something great, likely failing, something more mainstream, likely succeeding? Well, I, you know, I, I, I always, I, I would just, I would just push back on the premise of the question. So I, I, I don't like thinking of these things in these sort of probabilistic terms. I, I, I don't think we ever know what the odds really are. Um, 
you know, I, I, when I worked at, uh, at a big law firm in, in New York, uh, one of my friends uh, one day had bought a lottery ticket. And I, I was telling him, oh, that's a really stupid thing. You know, the lottery's just a tax on dumb people. Why are you paying this tax? <laughs> um, and uh, he had sort of a fairly good uh, comeback line, which was, well, Peter, how can you complain about buying a lottery ticket? You're working at this big New York law firm. You sort of just bought a lottery ticket with your whole life. You won't know what happens for eight years, whether or not you make partners. It's just one giant lottery ticket. <laughs> and, and this was, um, and it was, it was, a, it was um, and, and the, the odd thing, it was on some level he was right, but the odd thing about it was, of course, that um, if you talk to most lawyers, they don't think of themselves as taking crazy risks. Uh, they think of it as like a super low risk career, even though it ends up being um, ex in practice, I think, quite risky in some, in some strange ways. So, so I think, I think one, of the, one of the challenges is that we can, um, we can never quite, um, quite measure what these probabilities are, what these risks are. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of this very important philosophical question in business, how much of it is luck how much of it is, is due to skill. Um, and and it, you, you can't actually figure this out because you can't run the experiment twice. It just happened once. Um, my, my own bias is that, is that we should not think so much in terms of luck. Um, I, try to, I try to think in terms of conviction. Uh, you know, um, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Um, and if you say the odds are, let's say, you say the odds are 20% that this great thing is going to work, um, well, why, why is it only 20%? What, you know, you just think through all the different steps. And, um, and that's, that's, the sort of, uh, that's the sort of thing I would, um, I, would, uh, I, would, I would try to do. As an investor, I've, you know, there's always this temptation to, um, to treat uh, people as lottery tickets or companies as lottery tickets. And it's like, I'm not quite sure this is gonna work. It's high risk, high return. I'll invest a million dollars. I'll see what happens. And I, I, I don't like doing it for, first of all, I think it's a bad way to treat people. You shouldn't treat people like they're lottery tickets or, or companies even. Um, but it also makes for bad investments because whenever I think in probabilistic terms, I've often already psyched myself into buying a lottery ticket. I've already psyched myself into losing in a way. And the, the things that have worked best have been the ones where there's a, a very high level of conviction. And so um, when, when people speak in probabilistic terms, I often think that it ends up being just, um, you know, that, that uh, luck is just this word that we use when we get too lazy to think about things. And uh, instead of attributing things to luck, we should try to think really hard about what's going on. Or, you know, or, you know maybe, you know, luck is like an atheistic word for God. And we should, we should try to... Um, we should try to master luck and not let it uh, master us. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, well, you've talked a lot about uh, how you actually pick your investments, but I was curious in how you source them out, particularly in your early days when you didn't have email bombs and, you know, your mailbox full. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, what, what, what's the... So, how did, you find, how did you find Facebook, for instance? You know, how did you find LinkedIn? Were you knocking doors? Were, was it just a random email? Was it someone of someone or someone that got to you? Well, no. Again, I, I think it's um, again. I think sort of this sort of random search process is not is not the best way to, to go about doing things. Uh, you know, the uh, I'll say something about the the, the, fa the, the Facebook investment in 2004. Um, you know, my friend Reid Hoffman, who started LinkedIn, and I had been thinking about the social networking business for for quite a long time. He had started a company called SocialNet. Um, as far back as 1997. So he already had the whole idea of social networking in the name of his company seven years earlier. Um, there were all sorts of things that didn't quite work. They sort of had this theory that you'd have these avatars on the internet and it would all be in virtual reality and I'd be a dog and you'd be a cat and we'd figure out how we would relate to each other in, in cyberspace and it turned out people didn't really want that. But, uh, but so <laughs> we were, we were, um, but so we were actually thinking about this for, for a long time. And then um, after 2002, after eBay bought PayPal, we started looking at all these different uh, social networking businesses and, uh, and Facebook. What, you know, so once you'd done that sort of homework, uh, Facebook was an absolute no-brainer. It was really a low valuation. They just needed money to buy computers. Um, I think there were some really weird blind spots other people had. 
It's still a very strange question in my mind why nobody in Boston invested between February of 04 when it got started at Harvard and August of 04 when I met them in, uh, in Palo Alto. They were out there for the summer. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that the investors there had a blind spot, but, um, but it, on some level, it was really a no-brainer. I didn't, I, did, I didn't realize it was going to be as big as it was. I, I won't say that I was able to predict that, but, uh, but um, you know, in that context, it was an absolute no-brainer. Thanks. So, so your scene in the social network, I think, lasted about 30 seconds or something. But what, what, did, what did you think of the portrayal by Wallace Langham of, uh, of you? <laughs> you know, um, I was glad. Uh, I felt that the whole social network uh, film was meant to be incredibly nasty, so I was, I was quite glad that my portrayal was extremely brief, so I came off better <laughs> than most of the other people in that film. We had a, we had a Facebook uh, board discussion in uh, May of 2010, a few months before the film came out, and it was about how terrible this film was gonna be. We had a board dinner, and then we had a discussion at the next meeting. We canceled the regular agenda, so we spent eight hours dinner and the next, whole next day sort of worrying about um, how terrible this movie was going to be. It was going to destroy Zuckerberg's reputation. It was, um, you know, maybe we could have sabotaged it if we had been really clever two years earlier and threatened to defund them, but no one was on the ball. So it was all these sort of crazy post-mortems people went through. And, um, and I, do, I do think it was, you know, it's sort of the zero-sum world that's portrayed in the social network. I don't think has anything in common with Silicon Valley. Um, I don't think Zuckerberg stole anything. I looked, this was a question I looked at very carefully when I invested in, uh, in August 04. Um, I don't think the people on the, uh, the two rowing uh, people, rowing twins, were really the sort of people you expect to be programming a, um, a lot. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the, one of the factual details that, that got lost in the movie is that, you know, their dad was a plaintiff's lawyer, and he sort of saw this as the case of a lifetime. I always find that to be a kind of interesting factoid that's, that's worth pointing out. Um, but, um, but I think it's sort of, uh, I do think Hollywood is a very zero-sum world, and so somehow it, uh, it is an accurate portrayal of, um, of the very screwed up relations that, uh, that dominate Hollywood. But I think it was a movie that also in a weird way backfired culturally. So by the time that the movie came out, uh, four or five months later, we just uh, rented a whole theater. Everybody at Facebook went to see it the day it came out. We just decided we had to, we had to own it. And, uh, and people actually, interpreted it fairly positively. They ignored all the negatives and they just, uh, they just sort of said, um, you know, we thought Zuckerberg was really inspiring how hard he worked. Um, and uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of what happened with the Oliver Stone movie, Wall Street, in the 80s, where there were all these people who watched the movie and became investment bankers and they'd come up to, they'd come up to Stone and they'd tell him, it was because of your film that I became an investment banker. And uh, it's like, well, that wasn't really what I was trying to do, but... Um, no, you just, had, you just had to stop the movie 10 minutes before the end when they made a lot of money and before they went to jail. And, um, and I think the social network is sort of a much, even though it's a nasty film, it's much less nasty than the, the Wall Street movie was. And I think, um, and I think in our zeitgeist, it, 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 uh, it captured a lot. I think Silicon Valley is a place where young people are coming to in, in the U.S. To, to build a future, and I think, uh, I think that's, a, uh, that's a positive trend relative to, to New York, which dominated our country for so many decades. We have time for four more questions. Hi, Peter. I'll, I'll try to make them super fast. Maybe we can get a few more in, but I'll try to make them super fast. <laughs> My name is Will. Thanks for a great book and for coming out tonight. Um, I hear a lot about um, the strong bias toward particularly to, to young and particularly young founders in Silicon Valley, the whole ageism thing, if you will. Would you, um, would you comment on that phenomenon and, and specifically how you as an investor view age and, and it's, if it's a factor in, your, in, the, in whom you invest in? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any um, time that is the, the, um, the, the necessary time you can become an entrepreneur. I think you can become an entrepreneur at age, you know, under, under age 20. You can become one in, in your 50s or 60s. So I think there's sort of a wide range of different uh, times and places uh, people can do, do, do these things. Um, <coughs> I, I do think um, empirically uh, one of the very odd things that happens is that um, um, you know, a lot, you, you'll talk to a lot of people and they'll say, well, I'm not ready to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to get some experience. I'm going to save some money and then I will start a business later on. And I, I, I think that's actually very unusual. That seems to happen very rarely. People often end up um, uh, getting um, 
um, sort of sucked into these, uh, these um, high paying um, jobs with um, high, high consumption patterns and it's uh, very, hard to, very hard to break that cycle. So I think, I, I do think there's something where it's somewhat easier to do this in your 20s, but, um, but it, it always depends a lot on, um, on what, your, you know, what, your, um, what your personal expenses are like. You know, it's, I'd say like the, the basic, you know, one of the, one of the criteria that I've, I've often given is that um, the, CEO, the CEOs of startup companies, the less they get paid, the better they were. If all, if I, when I look at the whole portfolio I invested in, and, um, and when you have people saying, well, I'm not gonna do this unless I get paid a certain amount, that often sort of um, gets them uh, set, set off the wrong way. Thanks. So I was interested in some of your thoughts about higher education and the value of a university degree and the importance of, in fact, just going out into the world. Uh, as a young person, uh, myself and many of my friends are shackled to enormous student loan debt. Um, and I think I, I agree with the idea that there's much more value to be had in actual experience and actually going out and doing things. But we live in a world that is very married to the idea of degree upon degree, and there's this oversaturation of education now where you can barely get a job making coffee without a master's in socioeconomics. So I'm curious what you think would be the way to sort of wean the world off or the, the markets off their obsession with degrees and higher education and young people who are 29 before they do anything and have a couple hundred grand in debt when they do it. Uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, th I think we have like a giant bubble in education. Um, it's in some ways, um, it's in some ways even more insidious than the housing bubble in the last decade. I think the housing bubble was sort of an upper, the housing bubble was sort of a middle class phenomenon. The education bubble is sort of an upper middle class phenomenon. Um, and so there was all, and you know, the, me the media, and which sort of sets the cultural tone in our country, is sort of an upper middle class institution. And so. Throughout the housing bubble, there was a counter narrative. We made fun of it. It was all these really stupid people in Phoenix and Las Vegas and Miami that were buying all these condos. And there was a counter narrative that was possible. There is no counter narrative to the education bubble because um, the people in the, in, in, in the media um, typically went to all these great schools. Uh, they, um, their identity is very much wrapped up in this. And, uh, and so um, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to question, and that's I think one of the reasons this bubble has gotten to be so extraordinarily large. You know, we have now over a trillion dollars in, in student debt, uh, and um, and it's a it's a really tricky question, you know, counterfactually how good this is. It's true that people who go to college do better than people who didn't, but maybe the colleges just pick the more talented people, and 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 the you know the question that never really gets asked is how much more did people actually learn? Was it just, was it learning, or was it just some sort of selection uh, signaling? Uh, type effect. Um, my my guess is that the educate the education bubble will end when people sort of stop believing in it. I, I don't have a I don't have a formula for what the alternative is. Um, the you know the somewhat um, the somewhat um, troubling analogy I give, and I'm not sure it's troubling, but the the analogy I sort of think of is that I think I think the universities are about as corrupt as the Catholic Church was circa 1514. 500 years ago, it's um, it's uh, there's sort of a maybe, you know there's some, some diversity you know there's the diversity between the you know political science department at Harvard and at Yale is probably no greater than the, that between the Dominicans and Franciscans. You have all sorts of internal debates, but it's sort of the it's this very monolithic uh, kind of a system. Um, we, we're charging these indulgences that cost more and more for this priestly professorial class that confers degrees on, on people. Uh, you're told that um, the only way to be saved is to get a college diploma. If you don't get a college diploma, you will go to hell. <laughs> um, and, um, and, the, um, and the message that I have, uh, which is somewhat troubling, is like that of the 16th century reformers, uh, which is that you have to figure out how to save yourself. Um, and there is no institution, uh, and that's 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 a really troubling message, but uh, that's that's sort of what I believe, and I think I think I think as as more people come to believe that, I think this this bubble will collapse. Peter, I'm getting the hook from our timekeepers. Um, uh, Peter's going to stay and and sign, um, and, uh, uh, and he's he's he's, he's got to get someplace else. So I'm sorry to have to end the the questioning here. Uh, you've given us 
a great deal to, to think about. I think we've gone from zero to one plus just awesome. in this conversation. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you.